Um, thanks very much, everybody. It's a huge <coughs> pleasure and, and privilege uh, to be here with you tonight. Um, and I suppose I'm here for the same reason that the vast majority of you are here. Um, uh, firstly, uh, because I have enormous admiration for the work that uh, Catherine uh, Roisin and Stephen have done uh, over the lifetime of this doyle. Um, they've been in some ways very dark days for Irish democracy. Um, and it's really mattered deeply to all of us, I think, that we have had examples of democracy in action, of people who really have a fundamental sense of public service and what it means, um, who understand the concepts of accountability, uh, who do hold on to the belief that power does come from the people and that the republic does belong to its citizens, um, and, and who put that in action uh, in a way that transcends the sort of politics of patronage and clientelism uh, which has held the country back for so long. So on, on, on a personal level, it's, 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 it's lovely to be here. Uh, and I just thought it would be also an opportunity to just talk a little bit for the next five hours or so about, uh, <laughs> about uh, what is social democracy? What, what, what is it that we mean by this concept? Uh, and, and why do we need to address what seems in some ways um, a, a, a political concept that's been around for a very long time. Well, I suppose the first thing we say is it hasn't been around for a very long time in Ireland. Uh, one of the distinguishing things about Ireland, uh, when people ask why don't basic things work? Why do we not have a functioning system of childcare, for example? Why is our childcare uh, some of the least adequate and most expensive in the developed world? Um, why do we not have a system of, of, of public housing provision that functions? Why do we not have a health service that functions? Well, one of the obvious answers is we are one of the very, very few societies in Europe that has never had a social democratic government. Never. Um, social democratic values, social democratic institutions are under enormous pressure all over Europe and all over the developed world, but at least they have existed. And they have built things over generations, which are actually quite hard to shift. Even the Tories in Britain find it hard to take away the public relationship with the National Health Service, for example, because it has been built and because it has functioned. Not perfectly, but it has a really important place in people's sense of their identity in Britain. We haven't had that. We've had bits of it. And the bits of it that we've had have worked. Um, one of the reasons why social democracy, to me, is not an abstract concept is I wouldn't be here talking to you if it's not for the little bits of social democracy that we've got in the Irish context. Um, two big things happened to make me um, who I am, <laughs> for good and ill. Um, one of those is a massive public housing um, project. After the Second World War, when Ireland was on its uppers, when it, it was still in a post-war depression, when it was not sharing in the great prosperity of Western Europe, it still was able to clear the slopes of Dublin. Public housing was built. I grew up in one of those houses. I grew up in one of those communities. They were by no means perfect. They were by no means magnificently planned, but they were a hell of a lot better than what people had experienced before. My parents moved out of slums. They moved into relatively decent housing. That had an enormous impact on my life and on the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. If we could do that in the grim 1940s, why do we find it impossible to imagine that we could solve our housing crisis now? The second thing that really shaped me was uh, a bold, outrageous, reckless idea, which is that we went to free secondary education in 1968 when I was 10 years old. Uh, remember, this was brought in by, uh, by a minister against the wishes of the Department of Finance and indeed against the knowledge of the Department of Finance. Don, Don O'Malley announced it before it had been approved. Why? Because it wouldn't be, because it didn't make sense. We didn't have the money. It, would, you know, it, it, it was a, 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 an irresponsible thing to be doing. So you actually had to be a minister, had to go out and announce it, make it a fact. And then, of course, once it was a fact, it became something that was obvious to everybody. Um, why was Ireland one of the last developed societies to have free secondary education? Because we didn't have social democratic tradition. We didn't see this as being important. But if it wasn't for that, People like me, and again, hundreds of thousands of people like me, and I'm sure like many of you, would not have even got to secondary school. Uh, that was not, a, not something that was available to us. So social democratic choices being made at key points in people's lives are not abstract. They actually change the life chances of individuals, and by doing that, make a better society. Um, 
there's a sense, I think, in the a narrative that's being put out there at the moment that what we need overall in Ireland is stability, that the great value we need is stability, that what we have at the moment is working fine and we just need more of it. Uh, just three statistics, I don't want to bore you with statistics, but three that are relevant. One is we have, over the last five years, effectively doubled consistent child poverty. Now, leave aside the human cost of that. Leave aside the outrage of the attack on the basic human rights of children who are growing up in poverty. The economic fiscal cost of, of this is absolutely enormous. We know that whatever money we supposedly saved through austerity, we will pay 10 times over in the cost of health, of, of not having productive people in, in, in the economy pay taxes, in, in, in the cost of the criminal justice system, and so on and so on. We know this, this is evidence-based, this is not airy-fairy, this is reality. Uh, two figures from the OECD report on Ireland produced this week that really should be quite shocking to us, a startling to us. One is that one in six Irish-born people, people born in the Republic of Ireland, one in six of us is now living abroad. Uh, and they're doing so to a large extent by choice. Very, very many of these people are not people who are completely unemployed and don't have any choice whatsoever. Right? They are choosing to do so because they don't believe in this place. They don't believe that Ireland is capable of offering them opportunity to be the kind of people that they think they can be. And that's alarming to us. Again, it's bad for our society, it's, it's bad for our families, it's bad for our communities, but again, what, just think about the cost of that. These are people of working age who are largely very well educated. We're losing their skills, we're losing the dem demographic bonus that we have from having this young population. That's a fiscal cost, that's, that's an economic cost that we're not counting. Um, and one other startling figure from the OECD report, uh, 50% of Irish people, 50% depend on the state to keep them out of poverty. It's an astonishing statistic. It's the highest <coughs> proportion of population in the entire developed world. So one in every two people in Ireland would be living in poverty if it were not for social transfers. That tells us a couple of things. It tells us that the state matters enormously to huge numbers of people in our society, probably to the majority of people, in the simple sense that they cannot make a living, they can't live a decent life without the state. But it also tells us that our economy, which is in some ways a success story, in some ways it really is, but it's not an economy which is currently capable of allowing the majority of its citizens to actually earn a living, earn a decent living. 50% uh, of people can't make enough money in the ordinary economy without welfare payments in order to be out of poverty, and one in six are out of the country make, making their living elsewhere. And these are things that we tend to just accept uh, as normalities. And they're not normalities. Even if you look in the contemporary developed world with all its problems, with all the growing uh, massive disjunctions of inequality that are around the world, we are outliers in this regard. There is no other developed society of whom some of these uh, are true. And therefore, if we are unique in this, it, it suggests that we don't have to put up with these things. Things don't have to be like that. And so we come to social democracy uh, as uh, a political philosophy, the way of looking at the world that can begin to address these kinds of issues um, and, and make Ireland a better place for all of its citizens. I think social democracy, in a sense, um, is, uh, you, I, well, the first thing to say about it is that it's not a utopian set of ideas. Um, social democracy isn't based on the idea that the state, the government, can make everybody happy, um, that it can create a perfect society. It's not about that at all. Um, it's not about the maximum that human beings can achieve, because there shouldn't be any limit on what that maximum is. Social democracy is actually about the minimum. It's actually about what are the most basic things that people need in order to lead a dignified existence? That's the question social democracy asks. A dignified existence. What is a dignified existence? Well, a dignified existence really has five basic components. There are five things <coughs> that a human being needs 
in order to be able to feel that they are a citizen in a republic. The condition of being in a republic is, was defined by the Irish political philosopher Philip Pettit, uh, actually rather brilliantly, as that condition where we can look one another in the eye without reason for fear or deference. It's a basic equality. So we all look one another in the eye. We don't need to be afraid of each other. We don't need to defer to each other. Why? Because we are equal citizens. And that's fundamental to human dignity. That's what it means to be a full human being. And to do that, you need five things. First of all, you need the democracy bit of social democracy. And Catherine's already spoken about this, but it is very, very clear that the promised democratic revolution that we apparently had in, in, in 2011 has been nothing of the kind. Um, if anything, what we've had is a further centralization of power away from public control. We've had the entirety of Constitutional Economic Management Council invented. There's no, no basis for this in Irish law or in the Irish Constitution. It's now the most powerful body in the state. It counts to nobody. We've had an even further, it's very hard to actually say this, it did not seem possible in 2011 that the Doyle could become less central to the democratic <coughs> life of the country. Uh, it was already probably the weakest parliament in, in the democratic world in terms of its ability to actually do its job of imposing accountability on power. It's actually, if anything, become weaker. The use of the guillotine to force through legislation, the attitudes of governments towards the representatives of the people, as, uh, as again, Catherine uh, saw most obviously. When Michael Noonan uh, found himself giving exactly the same answers or explanations as to why he misled the doll as Ray Burke gave uh, in, in, in the early 1990s in the beef scandals. Ray Burke was, was asked beef tribunal, why didn't you answer these questions in the doll? And he said, well, if you don't ask me the right question, I don't give you the right answer. And Ray Burke said, or, or, sorry, uh, I was about to say Ray Burke, it's confusing sometimes. Um, <laughs> Michael Noonan gave exactly the same answer as, as to why he had refused to divulge information, which was absolutely pertinent to the questions that were being asked. The only thing that changed was that actually Catherine was asking the right questions, exactly the right questions, precisely the right questions, and they were still not answered. So that attitude to citizenship, that attitude to our democracy, uh, is, is, is an absolutely key one. Uh, we do need to empower ourselves as a political community. And this will not be done from the top. We, we, what we've discovered is that if things just carry on as they are, we may get minor reforms, but there is no real interest in using the capacity of our citizens to actually responsibly take part in the key decisions that affect their own lives. The second thing that's absolutely central is equality, is, is a notion of equality. Uh, and, and of course, equality has very many different parts. Uh, of course, it includes equality of, 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 of gender, of sexual orientation, of ethnicity, um, but it also has an economic component. One of the things that mm -hmm. social democracy brings to the table is that it says equality is not just a kind of set of legal structures. It's actually something that has to exist in our day-to-day -day lives. And there has to be a sufficient level of economic equality for people to actually be equals in the society. Um, which of us can look Dennis O'Brien in the eye without reason for fear or deference? <laughs> uh, I suppose we all try to do that. But, but the fact is that there are fundamental inequalities, and those inequalities come out of the grotesque disparities of income uh, and of wealth. And I don't think social democracy says, you know what, we're going to have absolute equality of income. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't try to do that. But what it says is that you need a sufficient level of equality in order for people to be able to function as equal citizens. Uh, and you need to have a sense that there is a project that we're moving steadily towards greater equality rather than moving away from it, as we have been uh, over uh, the last 20 years in most of the Western world. Um, what does equality mean? Well, we know damn well what it doesn't mean. We know damn well that if you double consistent child poverty over five years, you are building in structural inequalities which will distort our society for 20, 30, 40, 50 years to come. But we also know, and this is what social democracy has to add to this, that we're not doomed to do this. These cycles are not fate. They're not God-given. They can be broken. There are now extremely successful ways of intervening 
early in, 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 in the lives of children which can actually have really measurable outcomes in their educational achievements, their social connectivity, their relationship with the community in which they exist. We can actually do this, and we can do it in a relatively short period of time. Um, and it seems to me that if we prioritize equality in terms of saying, well, at least, at least our 18-month-old children should be equal. You know, at least we start with a sense that at the very beginning of, of life, children have the same kinds of opportunities, the same kind of chances. We don't have that right now. The most shocking documents in Ireland is developing the Growing Up in Ireland study, which is being done, a longitudinal study, which is looking in detail at a real group of children who were born in 2008 at the time of the crash. What do we see? We see that at three years old, you could walk into a room, you could strip the children naked, and you could pick out absolutely, with absolute accuracy, the children who were poor from the children who were not poor. Why? Because they look different. They look different at three years old. They're a different height, they're a different weight. This is what we're building into our society. We don't need to do that. There are other ways of prioritizing public policy to focus on the things that really matter. The fourth and fifth things that we need to focus on, uh, sorry, the third, third or fourth things we need to focus on are very obvious. I mean, one of the basic necessities for human dignity is shelter, is housing. Uh, we know that the market in itself is not going to solve the housing crisis in Ireland. Why do we know this? Because we've been through it. We've been through a period in which we built astonishing numbers of houses. The market you know, produced vast numbers of houses. Um, the market uh, produced, uh, from the late 1990s up to the crash, uh, produced 800,000 new houses in Ireland. It was one new house for every five and a half people in the country. I mean, astonishing numbers of houses. We still had 250,000 people in housing needs. So we had, at one point, we actually had 250,000 empty houses and 250,000 people in housing needs. Why? Because market-led housing, yes, of course it has a huge place, but it's not going to address the fact that in order to have housing as a basic human right, you need social housing. You actually need housing which, which conceives of the right to shelter as being a fundamental one in, in human society. And again, we know we can do this. We've done it before. Uh, for a lot of the history of the state, 30% of housing being, being built in Ireland was, was social housing. Uh, when Ireland was much, much poorer, it was able to do these kinds of things. There's no reason why we can't do it again. Yet what do we see? We see in the government's housing strategy a complete dependence on the market, on the private sector, on the rented sector solve these problems. They will not be solved that way. There isn't another way of doing it. And these are not necessarily things that require enormous genius. They require political priority, a sense of direction, a sense of long-term thinking about how we're, how we're going to deal with these things. And then the last two things that are very basic, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know here, are, are health and education. Um, we do not have, still, in this state, approaching its, its, its 100th anniversary, we do not have health system which treats the lives of, 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 of each citizen as being worth exactly the same as every other citizen. We know that there are grotesque inequalities in the way our health service works. But we also know that those inequalities are also grotesque inefficiencies. If you keep trying to do, as we, as we do, run two parallel health services, you shouldn't be surprised that you misallocate resources, that nobody quite knows what's going on, that you can't get a fix on how resources are being used. The basic principle of an efficient health service is that the money follows the patient. Uh, you know, that health professionals get paid for treating people. <laughs> it's, it's not that difficult to grasp. And yet, what we have is a system in which the clarity about where money is going, how it's being used, and whether it's being used for the very basic purpose of treating the people who are in most need first. Uh, all of those kinds of questions simply can't be answered within, within the system that we have. And again, we've had promises that this was going to be revolutionized. That the key social priority of the government, apart from the austerity program, was universal health insurance. It's been a complete failure. There's been absolutely almost no progress. And we see some of the reasons for that in, in, in the things that, that both insurance has had to stand up for. Uh, the use of patronage and clientelism going back into the allocation of, of basic resources. Putting justice into the health service, building a health service over time, which actually is capable of, of, of making a very basic statement, which is that the life 
of every single person in Ireland because you work as much as the life of every other person. Uh, it, you know, it has to be a key basic demand of, of, of social democratic party. And finally, of course, there's education. Um, we know that um, the shape of our society uh, is increasingly determined by education and that educational failures and inequalities reproduce themselves in an economy that doesn't work. The reason why 50% of people in Ireland can't make a living is because they are not sufficiently well educated. Uh, again, the OECD report is very, very stark on this. Um, people who, uh, who have less than a, a, a um, leaving cert in Ireland have 40% of the median income, not of high income, but the median income. You know, so education is shaping the economy and shaping people's chances within the economy. And education is a public good. It's not a private enterprise. It's a public good. It's something we do. It's something we organize. It's something we can organize differently. We can organize better. It's something in particular, again, that we can go back to start thinking about <coughs> how do we begin at birth and give children opportunities to develop themselves to be the best they can be. And think about the enormous economic, cultural, community, and social benefits that we would get from being able to do something that is actually quite possible, which is that by the end of this decade of centenaries, when we're actually looking at the centenary of the foundation of the state, we actually could be in a position to say that we have virtually eliminated child poverty. That might sound utopian, it's not at all. These are things which can actually be done. They are, they are practical policy approaches which can make these things happen. And if we were able to do those kinds of things, then we would be saying that we actually are a society which has the capacity to think about its future, which has the capacity to build things over time that make life better for the majority of the citizens, and that would return to our citizens what they've lost, I think, particularly since the crash, which is a sense that they can make a difference to their own lives, that they can have pride in their status as citizens, that they can feel that they really belong to a republic that also belongs to them. Thank you very much.